Welcome to another edition of Heavy Live with Scoopy. I am Brandon Scoopy Robinson, senior writer at heavy.com. It's always a party when I got my main man, Brevin Knight, NBA legend in the building. Brevin, welcome to Heavy Live with Scoopy. Hey, Scoopy. I'm glad to be on here, man, because this is, this is you have grown up now. This is a, a, full, a, a full coming around for me to, to be back, to be with you on this level. And, uh, and it's just a, uh, a treasure for me to be able to see you grow into until this man it's fun for sure and you and you just getting younger sir you getting younger <laughs> these these grades don't these grades don't they don't show i try the rest of the face try to keep young because these things right here they they give it away yeah yeah for those who are tardy to the party i've known brevin since brevin went, before you went to stanford you got a stanford, stanford hoodie on I remember you coached me at a basketball camp. There you go, Stanford. Um, you, you coached me at a basketball camp in Montclair State. And then when I started my career, when you were with the Cavs, man, I used to have my sneakers ready post game. This is when you were a rookie playing with Sean Kemp, Vitaly Pantampico, Derek Anderson, and Mike Fratello was the coach. You've been around a while. Um, defense has been your calling card. When you look back at the play of point guards during your era and the reign of point guards now, do you ever wish that you played in today's NBA era as opposed to the era in which you played in the 90s and the 2000s? It wouldn't be for the basketball that I would rather play now than in the 90s, 2000s. I can tell you that much. It don't got nothing to do with basketball. It has everything to do with the almighty dollar. There's a different dollar sign with basketball sure. now as for opposed sure. to when I play. But sure. but in terms of, of in terms of where guards are today, uh, I think for me it would be fun to pit what I do best against what today's scoring guards do best. Uh, and, and it was something that I always prided myself in trying to do. I would never try to outscore a score. I'm not gonna try to outscore you. I just need to limit you to bring you down to my level or just make it harder on you to now make it harder on your team. And so I think I would enjoy and relish that challenge. Uh, but I also think that I, I may have had a different mindset if playing in this game. Maybe I would have been a little bit worked on my offense when I was younger uh, to be more offensive minded. But I was just I was brought up on the game in a different way. You know, point guards, you guys are you, you yourself is secondary to the team. It is about making sure that your team runs well, and when they run well, and then you do well, then that's that's your yes, your success off of that. So, uh, it it would be I think it would be fun to see how I could stand up to uh, today's scoring point guards. Who would you savor a one on one matchup with in today's NBA? Uh, I, all of these. So you know, we we uh, with, with our. Grizzlies team with a, a job grant, I would love to be able to get out on the floor and play against uh, somebody with that talent and skill. Um, all Everyone, I, I looked at this like this, every new hype name that comes into the game, I want them. Right, that, that's, that, was, that's, that's just the, that was my nature. Like, he, he's supposed to be that. I want him. So uh, I, I say as to say, and not to, I say Ja just because he is the best of this young group that is coming up and up and that's up and coming. And so I say between he, De'Aaron Fox, I would love to play. But as a just as a just to have a throwback feeling, I would love to get back out there with Chris Paul again and just have the opportunity to now match wits, not just basketball skill, but you got to match wits when you're on the floor with him. Brevin, tell me something. Chris Paul uh, finds his way to the Phoenix Suns uh, after a year with the Oklahoma City Thunder. You cover the Memphis Grizzlies as a color commentator uh, with Fox Sports. <clears throat> when you look at the intricacies of what Chris Paul did this season um, and then what he could do in Phoenix, um, does it scare you? Was it a level up and does it scare you? Uh, it, it's a definite level up and it scares me very much in that when you are a team like the Grizzlies, that is, you, you hang around that kind of six through eight, six through ten. Your team is six through ten at this point with, with continuing to grow. When the teams that are nine, 10, 11, 12 start to get better, then you start to have, then you start to worry. 
the one thing that I, I feel confident is that this Grizzlies team, they were also were able to get better with the additions that they were that they had re-signed DeAnthony Melton. But then they have such a young nucleus that they are depending on. They'll be a year older. So it is the other teams got better, but this Grizzlies team got better. And the one thing that will happen is now is you just have full battles throughout the Western Conference as you go. There, the the stops of going somewhere and thinking like, okay, today you may have tonight you may have a chance. If you don't step on the floor ready, that's what Chris Paul brings to the Phoenix Suns. You will not walk out of there with a victory as easy as it could have been in the past. And so, uh, because of his influence uh, and because of Monty Williams' influence, uh, and then also getting Jay Crowder, the toughness side of the Phoenix Suns. Now you couple that with the skills players that they have. And that puts them into a different realm. And I think that's what those two uh, vets can do for them. The Memphis Grizzlies uh, laid it all on the floor in the NBA bubble. You saw it firsthand throughout the course of the season. Um, <clears throat> bumped into you doing broadcasting out in Philly uh, during the, the season and doing a good job. But I, I'm curious to know um, in year two for John Morant, what are you looking – What what are, what are – what are the expectations for him in year two in Memphis? Uh, I think for it's to continue to get stronger. Uh, that's first and foremost because of the way that he plays the game. He was going to, have to physically get his body into a better place so he could take the hits. Because you don't want to take away his athleticism. You don't want to take away his aggressiveness with getting to the basket. But you know, over time, if you're a slighter frame, those hits start to build on your body, and so. For him to get stronger physically. And then on the offensive end, for me, it's a mid-range game. Like, everybody else wants to talk about, you know, shoot the threes. Yeah, but he, his quickness and his ball handling ability is going to allow him to get anywhere on the floor he would like to. And when screen and roll situation, we found a lot of teams trying to go under his screen to try to beat him to the paint. So mm -hmm. that little 15 to 19-foot jump shot will present itself. Uh, I would like to see him continue to get – good at that shot off the dribble not a standstill but coming off the screen off the dribble being able to step up into that jump shot if he's able to knock that down at a, at a normal clip then it then that'll be fine the other thing is on the defensive side i like to see him be able to get into the passing lanes more he's mm -hmm. athletic he's long uh defensively being able to create some other op easier opportunities for himself so that you're not having to score against a set defense all the time right so th those are for me, some of the basketball things, but outside of that, it's, it's going to be continuing to his leadership skills, how to get the most out of this team on a regular basis. Uh, and and uh, listen, he, he has every tool. He has the tangibles, the intangibles uh, to make this organization go. And so I, I only look forward to bigger and better things from him. Rev, tell me something. Do you see a similarity between uh, John Morant's game and Derrick Rose's game? <clears throat> no, uh, I know some people like to say the thing with Derrick Rose's game was so physical, um, and, and that's not John Moran's game at all. His game is quick, fast, slithery, get by you, use that explosion, but not it's not a physical game. Derrick Rose was a physical basketball player. He was also uh, a guy in which once he got into the paint, he wanted the contact, and he played with contact, and so – uh, I think if you want to talk about explosion, yes, they're they're very similar. A young D Rose now, we're talking about when he first came in, Scott, that was taken off and dunked on you in a heartbeat. That is the similarity between the two. The other difference is Derrick Rose was a bas he's a basketball player. I don't call Derrick Rose a point guard. He's not a two. He's a basketball player. You need him to run the team, he runs the team. You need mm -hmm. him to go downhill and score, I'm going to get downhill and score because that's my mentality. John Moran is a pure point guard that can do all of the other things. So that that difference uh, keeps them uh, keeps them in two different categories. But in terms of explosion, just as explosive as Derrick, as Derrick Rose. To make a Memphis Grizzly to form a Memphis Grizzlies question while talking about the Lakers at the same time, I'm going to have at it. So look, when I was in college, uh, freshman year, 2004, Eastern University, you were in your alumni. I'm one. See what happens? The reverse angle. So I see I'm you got thinking. yours on. <laughs> so I got my, my special from my, my university, Eastern University in Pennsylvania. So you're Stanford alum. But 
when I was in college, freshman year, I won a lot of money in the dorms because I would utilize an NBA Live 2004, um, your Grizzlies team. Um, I, anybody from Jason Williams to Earl Watson to you to Powell the Soul to Shane Battier, um, we had the defense on lock. I don't care who we played. This was with the PlayStation 2. When you, when, you, when you had the hub, when you put the back of the game, and yes, then that's sir. When, now the updates automatically happen through Wi-Fi. Oh, why? How have we have changed with technology? So here's my question. Uh, Paul Gasol was a teammate of yours in yes. Memphis. His brother, Mark Gasol, uh, is a Laker now, uh, signed with the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, and um, if I'm not mistaken, you probably have run into Mark uh, because of Powell. And I, what are your feelings on um, Pau Gasol, as a player, what makes him special, and how do you think Mark Gasol helps the Lakers in Los Angeles this coming season? Well, I'll start with uh, number one, of course, Pau. Once Pau came into the league and was drafted, we all went to Memphis together. So myself, Pau, Lorenzen, and Wright, all went. Mm-hmm. Atlanta Hawks drafted Pau. The, the trade though was we all went to Memphis from there. Uh, and the one thing that I say for Grizzly fans is they never appreciated Pau Gasol and his greatness because he was not what Memphis fans deemed basketball was. Lorenz and Wright was what Memphis fans thought basketball was. Dirty, down low, physical, yelling in your face. Of course, Pau was slithery. He was smooth as a big guy, shot the basketball. He wasn't going to overpower. He wasn't going to talk junk. He was going to help his opponent up. He just did not fit the Memphis mentality. But in terms of basketball, he changed basketball in Memphis because he enabled them to have a star player that was willing to take the take shots at crucial points and could win games for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and during that time, that's when I had a chance to meet Mark because Mark came over with his entire family came to Memphis. And so we got a chance to meet Mark, uh, a young Mark Gasol, not knowing at all. That kid that we saw, you did not think at all would turn into the player that we see today uh, because you just didn't think, I didn't think that he was as interested in basketball at a young age as he was. He was just bigger than everybody else. And so was, was playing, but uh, he had, he changed his body uh, and changed his game as things went along. And so uh, Mark then becomes very similar to Powell's game, but just not as athletic as Powell. Mm-hmm. Same mindset in that you can play them with the ball out on the floor. They're going to be creators. They shoot the ball from the perimeter. They're, they're like most international basketball players that they play the game the right way. They stay and they do those good things. And so for Mark, he can now take that to the Lakers. And hopefully they're hoping that he can do somewhat of what Powell did when Powell was with the Lakers in terms of being a solidifying force down the middle of the floor. Again, he'll be a playmaker from the top of the key. And I think it'll allow – LeBron James, the opportunity to get back into the mid post again, as he just did last season when they had Rondo run the point. Rondo ran the point and allowed LeBron to run the floor. Now LeBron can throw the ball to Gasol at the top. He now can get involved in the play and not have to have his, have, his, have himself with the basketball out of the top of the key. So uh, it gives him not only offensive end, but defensively what it gives, it gives you a voice. Uh, and, and the one thing that I give Mark credit for is, he is going to be the most astute player on the floor at all times. He's going to know exactly what is going on with the opponent and be able to articulate it to his teammates from a back line position. And so if he can give them that, uh, then you mix. Yeah, you're not asking to be your go-to guy. You're not asking to play heavy minutes. But in the minutes that he will play, it will be a difference than what they saw with JaVel McGee and Dwight Howard with having Gasol. They're going to lose the athleticism lose rim runs, rim runs, you'll lose the lob opportunities, you'll lose the block shots. But what you get is position defense. So what you what you miss in block shots, you'll get in charges. You get in guys having to make an extra pass because he's there. Um, and so I, I think it'll be a positive for a, a veteran team. He's going to the right situation. Veteran guys that know how to play that will that will uh, appreciate what he does. Brev, you were listed as 5'10 uh, when you played in the NBA. Um, and when I look at some of the guys who are around your 5'10 stature, I mean that respectfully. Um, uh, I will say that I think of Roe Boykins. I think of 
Um, Isaiah Thomas, uh, former Celtic, former Wizard, former Laker, former Cav. Um, speaking for the 5'10 and below club, respectfully, I'm curious to know from your perspective, um, would you like to see Isaiah Thomas step on the basketball court again? And if so, where would he fit? Uh, I, I would love to see him get an opportunity only because to me, the injuries derailed his career. And if he is back to feeling 100%, then I would like to see him go out in that way. You don't want, you know, I don't want to see him go out playing hurt, jumping around from team to team. Um, that's not that's not the player that he is. And, and I think for him, the fit for him is a team that needs a guy that can come off the bench that is not position specific. And what I mean by that is he doesn't have to – he's not coming in as your setup guy. He's not come. he's coming in just to be Isaiah Thomas, who is a from fantastic score and can create opportunities for others off of his own aggressiveness. So if you are a – if you are a – Mid t- a team that's kind of in the middle of where you are with your seat, your, your team that you could be teetering playoffs, just need something to get over the hump. I think those are those are good teams for him that he can get over the hump. You go into other situations where it's already an established situation, then I feel like he is trying to fit into a mold of that team, something that will restrict kind of who he is. But if he can be if he can go somewhere and, and be like a Jamal Crawford was when mm-hmm. Jamal Crawford was six man of the year, I think he can be that type of player that comes off the bench uh, and can just give you an injection of life just from his energy. What did you enjoy watching him? Um, we, Heavy Live with Scoop B here with Brevin Knight. We are broadcasting on uh, Heavy Live Facebook, or rather the NBA team Facebook pages, the Chicago Bulls, Heavy on the Bulls, Heavy on the Lakers, Heavy on Celtics, as well as Heavy's YouTube channel and my Periscope via at Scoop B on Twitter. Um, when you watched um, Isaiah Thomas, and we're talking about young Isaiah Thomas, not the OG Isaiah Thomas. When you watch young Isaiah Thomas play for the Celtics, what stood out to you? How cool was it to watch him play? Uh, what stood out to me was just the, the the ease at which he could score. So you know, the the thing for smaller guys, I always say for smaller guys like myself is we've been small all our life. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't change once you go from high school to college, and if we're good enough to make it to the pros, because those guys were always bigger than us. We always mm-hmm. had to figure out how to score or play around taller people, and right. he was just able to do it at such a level that he could still influence games, still be the best player on the floor at his right. size because he's been doing it forever. The other thing I think that gives him advantage is he's left handed. It is mm-hmm. it is very hard for, for people that are right handed when you play against a lefty to translate the things that you do as a righty that they do as a lefty. Mm-hmm. It is just it's just a different rhythm. It's a different beat at which they play the game. Uh, and so I, I I marveled at the fact that someone of his someone of his size uh, could get whatever shot. That's the thing. He wasn't just a stand out here and I'm gonna shoot jump shots. No, no. He was getting to the basket, floaters, fin- using the rim to finish on on either side. So I say that as I say that started to be sort of a little bit of the progression of smaller guards, not just being guys that set up, and make things, and then make a shot. This just became smaller guards. Like, no, we take over games. And that, it was, so it was fun to watch him take over a game despite the size. Last question about IT. So you talk to players like 2017, 2018, and a little bit below that. You say 2016, 2015. One of the things that I would gather from just my investigative work is people say that the only thing that they can compare him to on the court just by watching him, just the blur that he is, um, is they compared that quickness to Allen Iverson. Do you see it? Uh, again, it's a different type of quickness, man. See, I, I had to play Allen Iverson. And Isaiah Thomas, to me, is is very quick with choppy sets. This is, like, I'm, this is how he beat you. Right. AI didn't play like that. AI played like, I'm here, I'm here. So he was more of a glide with how he played the game. Mm-hmm. I, I, my crossover, the crossover, though, 
you can get from A, forget A to B, it was A to C on his mm. crossover because it was so long and he can get from point to point. So the difference between those two is speed, yes, but speed in a different way. Speed with okay. choppy steps, and I'm, ah, I'm coming at you, and speed with I'm just gliding by you. I'm gliding by you. And now you are the hip, and I, AI is going to finish with, with – with, it it is still boom 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 like you didn't see that that's how the ball is going to bounce boom 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 boom. Mm -hmm. make moves like that with mm -hmm. ai is boom 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 so that the the rhythm and cadence of the two makes them different but it, they still they still get where they're going faster than anybody else with how they play so more moves for it with all of that with ai it is just i'm i got you you play for the Clippers. Um, Ty Lue uh, is now the head coach of the Clippers. Um, Y'all both were like pesky defenders in your in, during your career. Um, do you like the move? I like the move for the consistency. Uh, I like the move because the, they heard his voice for an entire season. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to have some type of of realistic chance, then it was. It's nice to to have somebody that was a voice already there. So I, I think that it'll be a a good choice in that way. Um, the biggest thing I think that Tyloo will have to get there with the Clippers is they have to number one figure out who they are as a team, um, who they are as an organization. Um, and then from there, they have to start to build some type of uh, expectations. And I'm not talking about the expectation of winning the championship. The expectation that we're going to come in the gym every day and we're going to get better as a unit. Not right. get better as you got better, he got better. But they got to get better as an entire unit. The, the biggest issue, I think, for the Clippers, and this has been this way for years, is that when you get into crunch time, the belief in one another hasn't been there enough to get them over the hump. And, and so who's going to be that leader? I, I think they've also been void of basketball leaders. I think they got some good leaders that sit on the bench that call the plays and they're coaches, but the guys that are on the floor playing, I don't know who that guy is. Like if you look at through Clippers teams down, I, I don't know who the guy that gets everybody together that says, come on, we're going to, we, let's do this. We're about to, I, I, Right. Uh, and so if he can if he can figure that out, uh, I think that's what will get them through the tough times, because right now it's just the tough times that they can't get through when everything is rosy and they're good. But when it gets a little iffy, that's when you need you need guys to stick together and be tougher. So hopefully uh, Tyloo can bring that uh, in, in his first season. And, and then the team, they, you can never doubt the skill that they have. There's just there's always just something missing. You played for the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, in the late 90s uh, with the team, as we mentioned before, Sean Kemp, Vitaly, uh, as well as Derek Anderson, uh, Wesley Person, uh, and uh, Mike Fratello was your head coach. Um, Zydrunas Ilgowskis was also on that team, if I'm not mistaken. Young Zydrunas. Um, yes. I want to talk about Sean Kemp for a minute. So Sean Kemp um, – was traded to the Cavs and okay. was you guys as veteran leader. Um, he just opened a dispensary in Seattle, played for the Suns before he came to Cleveland. Curious on your thoughts about him as a vet, and I'm wondering who is this generation's Sean Kemp? Well, first off, uh, as as a vet, Kemp was the best. Uh, Listen, I, I don't – I know everybody has their stories and all, all of, of what went down, but I have not one negative thing about – thing to say about Sean Kemp because he taught us uh, as young guys what not to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and he hung out with us as young guys. Like He, he easily could have gone off on his own. He was a multi-time all-star, big name, big contract. He didn't have to deal with four rookies, uh, but, but he was always willing to – take us to dinner, sit down and have conversations. Uh, he always patted us on the back as to you're good enough to be here. We're so we're a good enough team to be where we are. And so uh, I, I credit him with 
um, kind of getting us on the right path of you can go this way and do these wrong things. This may seem fun, but it's going to get you in the wrong place. Or you can kind of go down this road. You still have fun. It might not be the same fun, but it will be long lasting fun. And so we try to take the long lasting fun road that, that he tried to show us. And, and uh, I have I have nothing but uh, the utmost respect for Sean Kemp uh, and, and would never, there, there will never be a day that anyone could ever get me to say one thing negative about my man. He, he is, uh, to me, uh, he was a, a career saver for myself, starting off as a young guy, no money, no, never had money, nothing. People like you now and everything. So he was a guy that kept us uh, on, on, on point where we need to be. And, and today, Sean Kemp, Here's the thing, man. It's hard to say if somebody's today, Sean Kemp, because this is what Kemp did. Kemp was, if we want to talk about Zion with the way that he jumps, the way that he, with his athleticism and explosion, but this is the thing people forget. Kemp could handle. Kemp shot threes. Kemp could shoot the, dribb the dribble pull up. He could play off the mid post. He was electric on the offensive side. And if you want to take it back to like an old, take it old, because he got uh, Young guys today, the game is so different today. It's hard to try to say who's today's guy that looked like before because mm -hmm. the game is different. I like, I'd like to try to say that Sean Kemp was a more athletic Charles Barkley. Mm -hmm. Same thing is in Charles Barkley. It's different sides, of course, but Charles Barkley dominated the basketball game at every level. He wasn't mm -hmm. jumping over the top of everybody. Now, that's what Sean Kemp was doing. He was also then now jumping over the top of you while doing every playing every level and i say this b he got to be 300 pounds when we had the lockout we came back for the next two seasons sean kent was 300 pounds and still was given 20 and 10 mm -hmm. on a regular basis mm -hmm. you can still pencil in 20 and 10 and i told people why because this dude is better than what y'all gave him credit for y'all just wanted to label him as an athlete high school ad came out of high school lobs dunks but what i learned in cleveland was this is the one of the most skilled basketball players that I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you say that because um, I was out in L.A. last fall um, and sat with Charles Barkley, and I talked about the Zion um, <clears throat> comparisons, and he goes, he's not me because Zion is quicker than I was. Um, and he said that you can't always go 100 miles an hour. Sometimes you got to go 65 for self-preservation. And it's funny because he said that to me in September. <clears throat> and then I was in the TNT green room with um, Shaq, Charles, Kenny, Murray, um, during All-Star Weekend in Chicago at the House of Blues. And I said, we were sitting back talking, eating. And I said to Charles, I said, you still don't see it? He goes, hell no. He goes, he is Sean Kemp. He is not me. And so when I hear you talk about that, <laughs> it's like Charles will refuse to accept that for whatever reason. And, you know, I didn't play. He did. You did. But then I look at Zion and then I say, OK, so if Charles says he's not if Charles says he's not him. But then you brought up the, the analogy of, the you know, Sean gaining weight because of the lockout and still dominating. One, I feel like people praise Zion for the same reasons they gave Sean Kemp a hard time. And two, is it fair to say that is it that Zion is Charles Barkley with Vince Carter speed and agility? Perhaps it's just something you've never well, seen. My, well, he is definitely something that we have never seen. And, and I, I, we haven't seen with this height because there was a guy that played almost similar to him, left his name Rodney Rogers, who mm -hmm. was who was very similar to what Zion can do in terms of having a physical body, but is still one of them, is still the most athletic person on the court because Rodney Rogers would take a rebound, dribble the floor, punch it on you, or he would pull up and shoot it. So it be. We have seen somebody that looks similar. We haven't seen somebody that has now the athleticism to be able to be off the charts the same way. So I, I, I agree with Charles that 
he's not Charles Barkley, and people are gonna say Charles Barkley just because his body and and in mm. that way, and that's why you, you could say that, and I understand why Charles doesn't say it because of the athletic the, the athleticism, but uh, I see him more so being like a amped up Rodney Rogers uh, in terms of who he who he is. Sean Kemp in terms of explosion, similar to Sean Kemp, but I, he, he doesn't have the total game as a Sean Kemp. He doesn't have a total game as a Charles Barkley. Like I, people just don't re- people don't. I don't know if people don't know or don't want to remember. Charles Barkley was a beast when he was playing, and he was a beast from Philly days to the Phoenix days. <laughs> like so, the days of Phoenix when people thought he was done, he was a beast. And what was he doing? He was shooting jump shots. Like we made this all of a sudden that Big shoot jump shots as is some new phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Bigs have been shooting jump shots for a long time. Know what the difference is? They also could play in the post. The difference yes. is Bigs today, they can't play in the post and shoot jump shots. Mm-hmm. So now we are here looking for guys that can do either or. Whereas you took those guys, they were doing both. I can shoot this jump shot, but if you want to get if you want to get weak, I can take you down this post and punish you also. Brevin, I was watching The Last Dance back in the spring, and you made a quick five-second cameo uh, in the in the. In yeah, the... yeah, I was on there. <laughs> <laughs> that was your rookie year. You, your Cavs um, were something special. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, you were an eighth seed or seventh seed that year. We were oh. we were eighth. Uh, we were a seventh, a six seed, six seed okay. playing Indiana. Okay. What when you played against Michael Jordan, did he talk much? My, let me tell you this. So then, and, and for that, for that uh, documentary, during for that season, we're the only team to beat them multiple times in that season, and uh, mm-hmm. because they, they, I don't think they took us serious. A bunch of young guys running around. First mm-hmm. game we played them. We are, it's in Cleveland. They showed on the thing. When they can run out of the same way they showed them running out of the tunnel with that slow motion, you know, out the bull, they had the baggy, the low, the snap at the bottom, nobody snapped them. So that's all just flowing. We were in layup lines the first time we played them. We're in the layup lines, and me, Cedric Henderson, still my boy today, is a rookie with me, and he's from Memphis. We are in the layup line, and as we're, we're out first, layups, they start to run onto the floor. We stop in the layup line and just watch as they run onto the floor. I mean, you, for us, this is like God seeing Michael Jordan run on the floor. And now I'm about to play against him. And, and so Sean Kemp ran by, slapped us both in the back of the head, like, let's go. We got to play the game. Go on the floor, and we play a heck of a game. Only time I never heard Michael Jordan say one thing other than this. Bob Sura, love him to death, my dude talked he guards mike in the first quarter and does well comes out to start the second quarter talk a little bit bob's like oh god we good i got him mike hit us for about 24 22 in that second quarter and told him don't you ever talk to a legend like that <laughs> it was, at, at that point it was like it was literally like like we i mean we end up winning the game but that that was the one moment where i was like Dang. And then we, we, we had we had to finish off the game, but wasn't a big talker, man. He just was it was just he was just he was just phenomenal, man. He it was it I'm glad that I got it was I was glad but not glad, but I was glad that I got to see his greatness in a quarter. I got to see every move that you thought about that Michael Jordan did, I saw it in a quarter. And so uh that that to me is fun, but I still am able to say that. We were the only team to play them 500 and get multiple wins during that season. Yeah, and I remember that season, you guys played against them. That was the last dance year. There was no Scotty early on. Yes. Yeah. How do you how do you adjust to a team with do you fear a team without Scotty more than you do with Scotty? Like how did you deal with them that year? Because you played against them, I think, when he missed those games. And then you played against them in the playoffs where he played. How do you adjust without Scotty? Well, well, I I think there is 
the adjustment more would be if you adjust with there's no Jordan. Okay. If there, with there being no Scottie Pippen, you understand and you feel that he's not out there. And it, that means that you have a, a chance to win. Uh, but mm-hmm. there's still that the mad the, the man is still out there. So you still are more you're still more uh, worried about what he's doing. He still can win a game by himself. And uh, I, I just think the Scottie Pippen thing was this was a perfect compliment to what Michael Jordan did. He was he was a perfect compliment. He he was a all around basketball player, could do it all, but he still needed Michael Jordan to win. But I'm gonna say this: Michael Jordan needed Scottie Pippen to win. Mm-hmm. It, it went both ways. It was a it was a terrific marriage. It was one in which yielded the championships for them. Uh, but he it was. Would you be worried that Scotty was playing? If yes, if he wasn't playing, and Mike was playing, you would still be just as worried because Mike was playing. What I find interesting about your background specifically, um, your father, uh, Melvin, correct? That was his name, Mel, or Melvin? Yes. Melvin Knight. Yeah. Yes coach at Seton Hall uh, under um, <clears throat> uh, P.J. Carlissimo. Um, I feel like... Well, Bill Raftery. Okay. He, he was, so he was under Raftery, not Carlissimo. Not Carlissimo. Okay. So the fact that your dad was an assistant coach for a college basketball team, and then you were kind of... Well, you were around basketball. That You were around a lot of basketball minds. I feel like that's representative of today's NBA, where I consider you second generation, even though you didn't, your dad didn't play in the league. But at the same time, look at Kyrie Irving in that same vein. His dad didn't play, but his dad, you know, played in the city and around a lot of OGs. Rod Strickland being his godfather. When you look at today's NBA, I feel like it's today's golf in the sense of it's 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 a country club. It's not just about guys from cities trying to make it out. It's actually second generation, maybe even third generation guys that play in the league. How much of an advantage did you have uh, with your dad being an assistant coach in the Division One program that allowed you to, to excel uh, in the NBA during and even after? Uh, I think it, it it laid groundwork for my entire career. I mean, he, he laid the groundwork for what type of player I would be, um, and my brother and I also sit around and say he almost also hindered us in moving forward. And I say that because remember earlier I said we were bred as pure point guards. Mm-hmm. We sat down and talked. We our my dad worked out with us some. He we go and work out, but we did a lot more mental workout with basketball. Sitting down, we may watch a game, and and his question was why did that happen? Did you mm-hmm. see how what set that up to make that happen? So that's the way that we started. That's the way that we watched the game. We watched the game in terms of well, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Not just the play that happened. The play that happened is a product of some other things. And so we got heavy into being able to make sure that the other things were so good that the end product is good. And so that is that's how I played the game, which was make sure everybody is straight. Everybody's getting the shots they're supposed to get, holding them accountable. I right, mind myself, I'll get mine as it comes. But if I'm if, they, if we all if they if I got them all doing their thing, then that's mm-hmm. gonna put us in a position to win a basketball game. And so I, I credit him with being able to teach me the game of basketball, understand the game of basketball, but also be able to understand how to maneuver. He knew that we weren't gonna be big. How do we play in this game? And so I think the psyche of basketball is what uh, he taught me, but the other thing is why so many second, third generations because you're in the gym all the time. Mm-hmm. So the other thing is, I, you know, I always tell the story is my first year going to Cleveland, I played with a guy named Mark Bryant who graduated from Seton Hall. I was his ball boy when he was playing at Seton Hall. I was the dude running around getting on his nerves while he was there playing. And then I get to the league, and he's my teammate in the league. And so uh, it, it was – it was nice to have to be around a gym every day, shooting the ball. And so my dad also was very big on learning the right way. So there was no going out and doing the fancy moves. I would be in the gym mad because I would be going left, right, left hand layup, going on the other side, right, left, right hand layup, use the rim layups, floaters, like all of these 
but your fundamentals of basketball but i want to do some fun things but looking back i realized why we did it um it was never to be a pro that was always a good thing with my dad it, it the one thing that he expected we were going to be great students and then after that we can be good individuals good basketball players and so uh it, it he just always the plan was just if you can just keep progressing things good will happen to you and just having to be in the right places at the right time. Couple more questions. Brevin, tell me a funny Mike Fratello story. <laughs> well, listen, we gotta tell a good we gotta tell one that we can tell. We we, we got some we got That's some Fratello stories. We got some Fratello stories that, that, that stay there. But I just the biggest thing I say for Mike is Mike is the biggest Mike is has a short people's complex we all have right. and that we feel like we gotta we gotta uh, i gotta be i gotta be over the top i gotta be ready and aggressive at all times because you're looking at my physical stature like if i'm not on guard you feel like you can take advantage of me mm -hmm. so the thing with mike was we had i had never seen as many confrontations and practices around games locker room that you saw with fratello i mean we would get into straight cursing matches you this that that but this is what i love about mike we would leave the day he was like brevin come here he would give me a hug and give me a kiss kiss on both cheeks that's the that's how italians show their that's how they show their love and appreciation for the next person and so fratello would be curse each other out in practice i'm talking about f u f u i'm the whole thing to leave the gym kiss on the cheek i'll see you tomorrow and so it's the the funny stories for Tello are stories you don't tell. Okay. So the thing that I like for the thing that I, I, I the thing that you say for for him is that and what he allowed he allowed you to be you, be you. We gonna play the game. We, we gotta play the right way, but be you. You get upset, get upset. I'm gonna get upset. That's fine. We'll have this. But at the end of the day, understand that I love you. Understand that I want the best for you and this team, and then we can go from there. So. Uh, from him, and the third I say Fratello, Bernie Bickerstaff, um, in terms of my NBA coaches, though those are the two people that had the the most influence on me as basketball players, but also as a human being. Uh, those two guys helped me. The attitude side, Fratello loved it. Let me be who I am. We both Jersey guys. That's what we do. When I got to Bernie, it was like now who you are now in the second part of your life. There's another way for you to act. There's another way for you to be able to now lead a basketball. He gave me the opportunity to lead a basketball team in the seventh year of my career where people said I was done playing. They mm -hmm. said I was done. You shouldn't be on the team. Bernie said, I'm going to give you a chance. You're the third point guard in camp. You come to training camp, you're the third point guard. I said, right, right, listen, just give me a chance because whoever you think is in front of me, they not better than me. I've had to live this life for my entire life. So I went in there and was able to become now the starting point guard. And so it, those those two guys, Fratello was phenomenal. Bernie, you got more, a lot more funny stories with Bernie because he is just, Bernie called me El Diablo. That was my name, which, which in Spanish means the devil because he felt like I was just evil. And I was evil because I was out the lead. Yes, I was evil because I was out the lead. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to be out the league. And so it, it took me back to my jersey, grimy, got to do what you got to do. And, and so that, that enabled me to, to prolong it. But uh, those, those two guys were great. Of course, with Bob Farrell, my high school coach, he was, he was phenomenal. to get me where I, where I could. And then Mike Montgomery taught me how to be a more X and O's player not mm -hmm. rely on your coach to have to be the person that gets the most out of you. Hmm. Um, uh, and, and so that, that, that was a, a growth and learning experience for me being there also. Utah Jazz, um, you were there playing under Jerry Sloan, um, the late Jerry Sloan, um, at a point where it was post Malone, post Stockton, and you look at the Jazz now, and it's like cool to play for Utah because you got Donovan Mitchell who just got the bag. 
when you look at the Jazz. See, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's a different league now. Different league. <laughs> what about Utah? From you, I've never been to Utah in my life. What about Utah has changed from when you were there to what it is now? Uh, well, well I, I think they have a, it's a the vision is different now. See, I, I hated that I came in on the heels of Jerry Sloan. I came the, the one year and my last year in the league, uh, I think it was his last year also, he was done. Um, and I, I, I hated that I was not able to get the energetic, vibrant uh, Jerry Sloan at that point. And he was done, I think, because the game had changed so much. And it changed to become so much of a player's league. And the run-in that he would have with Darren Williams just in terms of the the way that they saw basketball. You know, Jerry was, we're going to come down and run this one four high. We're going to run these plays. You'll get what you get off of running this motion. Like, everybody going to eat off of this motion. Well, Darren Williams wanted to prove that he was better than Chris Paul. So you got me out here playing the team basketball. I need to be out here showing what I can do. And so I think the dynamic of that, because of that team that we had, is is arguably the best talent team that I, I was on my entire career. And I was happy to just sit back and I was like, maybe I get a chance to, like some of these other vets, ride the coattails of some other team and just be able to see really good basketball and see how far it could take us. Um, because you say we had Darren Williams, Kirilenko, Boozer, Mehmet Okor. Now, let me tell you the young guys we had. Paul Millsap, Ronnie Brewer, we had uh, C.J. Miles, Costa Kufis, um, myself. Um, so we, uh, we, you, you, the the team was built to win. Like it was built to win. And every day I would go in and just tell guys like, y'all, y'all are, you guys are throwing away a season. And I'm telling y'all, it's my twelfth year. This thing goes quick. And if you throw away seasons, it comes back to bite you. And from that point on, they were never able to really see success until now this new regime has come around and we see Utah basketball. And I think because what what is special about Utah is their fans are great. Mm -hmm. The organization, phenomenal. They do a great job because they understand, they understand there's a human side to this game also. There's a business to this. This is the business of basketball. But there's still a human side. And I thought that their organization did a great job of Yes, we had the business, but they had the people in place to really take care of the family, to take care of the players. To this day, I still get uh, mail around my birthday, holiday cards that say from them to me. And I, only, I played it one year, I averaged two points. I, I did nothing for them. I, I, more people in Utah know me from Stanford than they know me from playing for the Jazz because I played with Rich Jackson, who was from Provo, who was a son of Utah when he was coming out of high school. And so that's why people in Utah love me because of that. I got more, take this up, more little white kids running around with the name Brevin in Utah than, than anywhere else. I met three Brevins. I met three Brevins when I was playing there. And, but that, and it was not because of what I was doing with the Jazz. It was what I did with Stanford. And so, the fans there, they they love their players. They love the people that play for them. And if you say something good about Utah, if you are as proud of them as they are of you, it goes a long way. I still go to Utah today, and every one of the people, the us, the people that work there, still come up and give me a hug, say how much it's good to see you again. Oh, and and that's, that is from one season of averaging two points. And so for that, for that, I say that it was a pleasure to be in Utah and see that side of Utah, see those fans. I wish the team would have been in a better place. I wish Jerry Sloan would have been in a better place. Uh, but I have nothing but positive things to say about that organization and that fan base for their players. Now, when you're the opponent, it's a whole nother, it's a, it's a whole nother deal if you're yeah. the opponent. Brevin Knight, the politician, Brevin Knight, the retired player, Brevin Knight, the broadcaster, <laughs> Brevin Knight, the fighter. In practice, I have seen uh, many different realms of you in this interview. It's always a pleasure 
um, to talk to you because I remember when they when 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 they weren't trying to give you a scholarship and then Stanford came calling and then you become classmates with Tiger Woods and Chelsea Clinton in Stanford. <laughs> hey, look at there. Yeah, Tiger Tiger still ain't giving me no lessons. My golf game still struggles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, brother, here's the good news. You are off the hot seat. Man, I, listen, you can put me on the hot seat anytime. That was that was fun. I like <laughs> being on the hot seat. I like answering questions. Know what yeah. I don't like doing? I do what? not ask questions. There's a gift. There's a gift that y'all have at being able to ask questions. I tell people all the time, I'll do an interview. I am not an interviewer. If you had the opportunity to have an expert skill set, like I have my 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 maybe my fave five like of, of interviewers, so like Ed Bradley for me, Barbara Walters, Angie Martinez, yes. um, and probably I can't think of any two right now, but those are the three I'd mention when I'm being interviewed. If you had the skill set of you had to add something to your repertoire now as a, as a color commentator who does some post game interviews, who do you like? Um, and, and who's, who's, whose skill set would you like to add to your repertoire? Uh, I, I see, I'm a, I'm a Hugh Brown fan. You know, I had Hugh as a coach in Memphis and, and um, what I like about Hubie is Hubie talks basketball mm -hmm. and he slides a stat in there every now and then hit you a number, but he talks basketball. And so whenever I, whenever I'm sitting back and I'm, I'm listening to something they've done, I've learned something. Uh, and, and so that is, to me, he's the guy that I try to, uh, I try to live up to his standard of what it is to be an analyst. Um, I can tell you that a, a guy that I really enjoy listening to uh, this during the bubble is Stan Van Gundy. But I, I, it was I, it was refreshing to just hear basketball. You know, Stan was trying to make you laugh. He was he Stan was just straight talking basketball. And so I like to watch and listen to all to, to everybody that he you know, talked the game. Like, like that's that's like we I see this job as being one, and I get an opportunity to teach somebody something. And I want to make that. I I, I don't want to miss out of it. I like that. We still have fun on all of our shows, but once that game gets going, have some fun. But I want you to teach me something. Uh, and, and I don't need a story. I don't need you to hit me with a hundred stats. Don't tell me a per forty-eight. Per, no, I want to know why this is happening for this team. How is it happening for this team? And so uh, those people that I mentioned, those 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 they they have they have done. They have done that. You heard it first, brother. Thank you. <laughs> man, I appreciate it, man. I, I, I uh, listen. You know me. I, I, you, you and I, we can, we can talk and do this. Uh, I can do this every, any day of the week with you. I mean, it's, it's certain people that I can get on here, and and it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't turn out well. But but the, with, with you, I, I can even give you a full a full hours talking time. Some people I get on here and I'm like, hey, listen, I got I can give you about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, man, then I'm ready to go. Because eventually you're going to start talking about stuff that has nothing to do with not, nothing really, nothing to do with, with like sensible things. Like I, I can't just. I can't just get on and talk about just anything. And so I'm glad you asked me about the announcer because I'm going to tell you one other one who, is a, who, who I love to talk to, who I did who? not grow up on at all. It's Greg Kelser, who does hmm. the play, who does the analyst work for the Detroit Pistons. I would be remiss if I did not bring him up because after getting into this and then watching and seeing other people and then sitting and watching games, I really, and then talking with Greg before games, I realized that if I was gonna be in it for a long time, I better start to be like him. If I'm gonna do this there for a long time, see how he, you guys try to, try to move how he moves, um, and while still being Brevin Knight. And so uh, this, I, I didn't want, I, I couldn't leave Greg out in, in, in that in that sense. 
Brev, I got to ask you this. Since you said I, you don't mind doing a full hour, we're at 54 and almost 50 seconds. Let me ask you a question. So you look, <laughs> at, you look at Tyler Hero on the Heat. And to yep. me, and I put this on Twitter, and we talked about it on Twitter. I said, he reminds me of a cross between your former Cavs teammate, Bob Sora, as well as Clay Thompson. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. I see it because here, the, the, the dead eye shooting of Clay Thompson. I think he had he said, the swagger of Bob Sewer. Like a lot of people might not remember Bob Sewer, but when he's Florida State came to the league. B Sue was he was the swag white guy. Like at the end of the day, like you look throughout the league, who's the, who's the, who's that dude? You that's like it was Bob Sewer. And now I look around, you look at Tyler like Tyler Hero, like that same swag to how he played the game. Like I'm out. I don't matter. I don't care what you do. This is what I do, and and so uh, it was. It's it's fun to watch him play. Like I even went back and watched some of his high school games where people used to go at him, and the way the crowd and he used to just the way he would shake it off, and he just go out there and just cook people. And so mm -hmm. uh, it, it was it was it's fun to watch a young fella get out there and, and play with a little bit of an edge. Just, he he almost remind me a little bit of a young Devin Booker. Devin Booker was the same way. Devin Booker came this thing with that same edge, that same swag. And when mm -hmm. he and the when I knew he was real, when we played he went up against Tony Allen, and when early in the beginning of his career, against Tony Allen, I'm like, this dude was giving Tony Allen problems. Mm -hmm. And it was strictly with his confidence. Like usually Tony, Tony will rattle people. After a certain amount of time, he he gonna rattle you. Mm -hmm. Young fellow didn't get rattled. I'm like, hey. He gonna be a problem for some years to come. I like it. I see a podcast or or, or some type of uh, branded content in your future because you have a, a lot to offer. Like like the Brevin Knight and Sherman Douglas show. Like 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 y'all are like basketball <laughs> brainiacs. Sherman, that's my that's my dude there, man. Listen, Sherman was see. I'm, I grew up Big East. You know, we back being back back east and, and being able to watch. Watch him throw lobs, watch him the way that he 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 was again those that point guard that controlled the game. If you needed something big, he made it happen. I, I was a I was a huge Sherman Douglas fan. Let's turn that CBS on. They the big Syracuse is on. Put them on. <laughs> <laughs> That's my guy there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey man about Strickland. You know you talk a lot about Tricky Strick. Mm -hmm. that, those uh, my first time being able to play against Tricky Strick, I was scared as heck. I ain't gonna lie, I was nervous as heck. We played them in the summer league. They came over to, to Orange, New Jersey, and we get out here. We got there playing around. And the good thing was he didn't know who I was. He didn't know I was the the defensive guy from this area. That's all I did. Mm -hmm. Man, it was, and I think I was so scared. It was the best defense I played in a long time. To so when the game was over, he's like. Man, who the hell is that little black dude kept putting his hands on my ball? Like, it wasn't that I was stealing it every time. He like, he just keep touching it, though. I'm yeah. saying, he, he just keep touching the ball. And, and so, you know how it is, school. We all got to make our name somehow, some way. You know what I'm saying? My name was going to be, I wasn't going to jump over the top. wasn't out of score, but I'm going to steal this basketball. I'm, I'm going to steal this basketball. You better be ready for that. Mm -hmm. I still do it today with these young kids. I get in the gym. We get working out. My son and his teammates, they all in all in high school. So we work out in the mornings and they want they think they got one-on-one -on -one chance. I said, Y'all got a chance. Y'all all dribble the same way. So yeah. how y'all make the same move? As soon as you I'm just waiting on it. Like how you, you know, this this the excuse. We're not gonna place people like you in high school though. I'm like, yeah, but this will make you just so just get better. But you better change that moves. I'm gonna keep taking them. They think a lot of these young kids think that because and I mean this respectfully, because you're not a LeBron or because you're not mm -hmm. you, you're not so and so that they could beat you. And I remember seeing this on Instagram. Danny Green was like, Yo, I'm sick of y'all telling me that y'all think y'all can beat me. You can't beat some NBA player. I don't care if they're the 12 man, 15th man or the best, I will bust yes. your ass. Yo, you said it right. I tell you go watch any of these dudes play in the summertime. Oh, you you'll get an entirely different picture of who they are. What they do is when you get to the NBA, you understand that we're all good. Mm -hmm. You know what happens is, how do I have a 10-plus year career? That's right. what I look around and say. 
Because you know what? I don't give a damn what you at home say anymore. See, that only mattered to get me here. Now that I got here, to hell with what you think. I'm talking about what these executives think. And so what do y'all need me to do so that I can maximize this money in these years? Because in the summertime, I cook everybody that got what something to say. You come in the summer and get cooked. Now, when I Work. go back to the league, they're like, well, why? why you don't play the same way as you just played in the summer? They don't need me to play like this. Mm-hmm. They need me to be this way. I save all this other stuff so I can come on your ass in the summer. I save yep. that for you. But this yep. is how I do my job over here. Yep. We hit an hour. We out. <laughs> Appreciate you, fam.